This conference will now be recorded. All right, cool, cool, cool. All right, so yeah, so we're gonna talk about purse lines. Um, kind of an overview of the coverages, give you a little bit of an understanding. Um, and then um, of course, with my online material, you definitely have more detail, uh, but I wanna get you started. So, uh, right, let's go here. Boom. So the topics we're gonna kind of, uh, Cover today, uh, personal auto, dwelling. Now, for the tw for the exam, when you hear dwelling coverage, think of you're a landlord, okay? Uh, you own a house, you rent it out. Versus a homeowner's policy, you own it and you live in it. Uh, we'll discuss covering uh, a boat. There's different ways of covering a boat, and also depending on the, the type of boat, the size of boat. What has absolutely nothing to do with boats is floaters. Um, and that would be like a jewelry floater uh, where you're, you're kind of covering high ticket items for higher amounts than what your homeowner's policy will typically afford. And we'll get into that. And of course, you definitely want some liability coverage. I mean, California is a Sue happy state. Um, what they say, more attorneys per capita uh, than any other state. So you want to make sure you have some lawsuit protection. And that, we'll kind of review that also. So first things first is a personal auto policy. Now, when you're doing your online studying and, and doing your required class, they're going to call it a personal auto policy, or you might just see acronyms PAP. And then you go take the test and it says under an ISO PAP. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa what's that? I didn't cover that. Uh, the ISO is the insurance services offices. And the ISO is where your insurance companies get their policy forms. All right. So all of your insurance company's policies are quite similar. All right. it, it's kind of a standardized form um, that they just kind of pull from the ISO. They kind of add their terminology, maybe move it around on the page a little bit, but it's, it's pretty much standardized. All right. And so an ISO PAP is the same as a personal auto policy. So don't get bogged down by that. Another thing they're going to throw at you on the test is they'll use that word unendorsed. So unendorsed personal auto policy is basically you bought a personal auto policy that has no endorsements. So you bought a stock policy. All right. uh, the reason I want to emphasize this because it throws people. Uh, some people are stressed when they take a test and in all their studying, you know, they, they, they study personal auto policy, this personal auto policy, that PAP, this PAP, that. Then they take the test and they say under unendorsed PAP and they're thinking, oh, what the hell is that? You know, and it, is, that a, is, that a, is that a new policy that they brought out that we didn't cover on my online stuff? Um, no, it's the same thing, okay? And so take a step back. Unendorsed means you just bought a stock policy, no bells and whistles. All right, keep it that simple. And they'll do this for homeowners too, by the way, okay? So as far as looking at a personal auto policy, you got to understand the coverage parts. Liability is listed first. Now, in California, we have what's called split limits. And the minimum liability um, in California is 15, 30, and 5. Now, the 15 is 15,000, and that stands for bodily injury uh, per person. So if you have these minimum liability limits of 15,000, that means if you hit someone, we're going to pay a maximum of $15,000 towards their medical bills, right? their lost wages. How about if you hit them so hard that they pass away in the accident? That becomes a death benefit for their family members. And I don't know about you, but I don't think 15,000 goes very far when they have a mortgage and, you know, you took out the breadwinner, you know, college funding for the kids, living expenses. And this is where the lawsuits come into play. All right. But the first number is bodily injury per person. The second number is 30, which is 30,000, and that's bodily injury per occurrence. That means you hit a car or you hit a couple pedestrians or you with a couple people in it. So we'll pay a maximum of 15,000 for any one person, but no more than 30,000 for the whole occurrence if you hit multiple people. So again, no more than 15,000 for any one person, but no more than 30,000 total for that particular incident. That's how you want to understand that. Uh, the third number, the five stands for 5,000. That's damage to the car that you hit. Uh, it's property damage coverage. Now, it may not be a car. What if you lose control and you go through someone's living room? Is 5000 enough to rebuild their living room? You see what I mean? And so you can always buy higher limits. 
And so, yeah, you should do a liability exposure worksheet to determine what liability coverages you should have, and then your insurance limits should match or exceed that. So I'm just using minimum liability limits in California. Each state's a little bit different, okay? Um, I just talked to someone in Georgia, and they're 25, 50, and 10. If you're from Florida, it's, you know, 10, 20, and 10. Okay, so a little less per bodily injury liability, but a little more for property damage liability in Florida. All right, so every state is slightly different. Okay, Part B is medical. So if liability covers the people in the other car and covers the other car that you hit, medical will cover you and your passengers in your car. And it's a per person limit. So if you had, you know, 5,000 in, in medical payments, that covers you and your family members. They each get up to 5,000 towards their medical bills for the injury in that accident. Um, it's not a health insurance replacement. A lot of people do have health insurance, but you might have a deductible. And so this can cover the deductible and you can use your health insurance. Okay. Um, and that part C is going to be uninsured motorist or underinsured motorist. That means you got hit by someone who doesn't have insurance, all right, and it's their fault. So remember, your liability pays them if you're at fault or you're responsible for their injuries. But if someone's responsible for your injuries and they don't have insurance, then there's nothing to collect there. You'd have to sue them and good luck with that. They may not have anything to sue for. And so uninsured motorists can pay you and your family members for your medical bills and your lost wages, okay? Uh, because the other person's at fault and they just didn't have insurance. Um, that's a UM. Now UIM is under insured motorist coverage so you got hit by someone they have insurance they just don't have enough to take care of your medical bills and your lost wages you know because maybe they're driving around with a minimum of 1530 they hit you and you're racking up a hundred thousand in medical bills and so you're going to collect 15 from them and then your policy can make up the difference up to the limits that you have on your program okay um, and notice in coverage c there's only two numbers 15 and 30, um, because uninsured motors and underinsured motors only cover the people. It doesn't cover your car if you got hit by someone without insurance. That's a different coverage called uninsured motors property damage or UMPD, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a second here. Okay. Coverage D is physical damage. Direct physical loss, damage, or destruction to your vehicle. All right. Um, and it's broken down into two parts, collision. Now, when you see collision, that means it's your fault. You damage your car because you drove into a tree. You damage your car because you hit another car and it was your fault. So that's a collision claim. Usually a higher deductible and your rates will go up because it's your fault. Uh, collision covers colliding with a vehicle or object in the road or upset. When you see the word upset for the test, that would be like your car rolls over because then you would be upset. And you do hear stories, people driving, you know, for long distances, they fall asleep at the wheel and they drive off the embankment and roll their car uh, off, off, off the edge. Um, that would be a collision claim. Other than collision is if something damages your car, that's not your fault. So if a tree falls on your car, that's an other than collision claim. If you drove into the car and damaged it, right, uh, that would be a collision claim because you, you, you drove into it. So other than collision would be something hits you. The most common other than collision claim would be like a windshield chip. Okay, something pits your windshield. That would be an other than collision claim. Uh, other than collision also covers theft laws. Hail damage, all right? Um, now theft, but let me go back. Theft of a vehicle or part of a vehicle, all right? They stole your um, catalytic converter, which is quite common nowadays, and it's driving uh, auto insurance rates up, okay? Um, they steal your tires, whatever it may be, even your hood ornament. Anything bolted, welded, nailed, attached to the vehicle would be under physical damage coverage. All right, so it's either your fault, which is collision, or something else, which is other than collision. All right, and that's how you need to understand that section there. So how the policy works. I, I just want to make sure this is a clear picture. So if you hit someone, so let's say you're the red car here, and you hit this, what, tail end of this, it looks like a, a, an SUV. Your bodily injury coverage covers the people in the car that you hit. Your property damage covers, covers that car that you hit. Your medical covers you and your passengers that were injured in the accident that you caused. 
And of course, your collision coverage covers damage to your car because you were the one responsible for it. So in just one accident, I mean, we're looking at already four parts of your policy is paying on a claim. That's how you want to understand it. Okay. And F, let alone towing. Okay. <laughs> that's a, if your car's not drivable, then yeah, you definitely want towing coverage. Uh, but that's an optional coverage. And so this is kind of how it works. Now, if someone hit you, then it's their liability covering you. Their bodily injury covers you and your family. Their property damage covers your car. Okay. Uh, then they have their own medical for themselves and whoever's in their car. Right. And then they have collision coverage to cover their car. That's how you want to understand that. So additional coverages, uninsured motorist property damage, or a lot of times you'll see it as UMPD. Now, if you only have liability coverages, now when I say liability, let me back this up. Oops, the other way here. Uh, liability would be coverage A, B, and C for the test. So on the exam, whenever you see liability coverage for personal auto, they're talking about coverage A, B, and C. So if you only have liability, which is coverage A, B, and C, then you're going to get uninsured motorist property damage, and it's going to pay a maximum of $3,500 to your car because, remember, someone hits you, they damage your car, and it's their fault. And so if you have UMPD, uninsured motorist property damage coverage, it pays a maximum of $3,500 to fix your car. That's it. Now, if you have physical damage coverage, which includes collision coverage, then the UMPD becomes what's called a deductible waiver. So if someone without insurance hits your car and you have collision coverage with UMPD, the UMPD will actually waive your collision deductible. You're going to use your collision coverage to fix your car, and it'll be a no-fault collision claim so your rates don't go up. Okay. Now, for the test, they really don't get into the deductible waiver portion, uh, but it is very common to see the $3,500 for um, uninsured motorist property damage. Towing and roadside assistance. I kind of present this as if you actually had an incident. So imagine it, it was raining today. I, I'm here in Brentwood and it was raining today. So imagine if you got a flat tire in the rain, let's say even in the middle of the night on the freeway. Now, do you want to get out of your car and fix that flat to go on your merry way? Very unsafe and you know, um, rainy condition. Or would you like someone to come out there and fix that flat for you? OK, if you want someone to come out there and fix that flat for you, then I would add towing and roadside assistance to your policy. OK, because someone will come out there, they'll fix a flat, give you a jump, unlock your key if you lock yourself out of your car or tow you to the nearest shop because you, your car's not drivable for whatever reason. That's what that's about. Now, if you get into an accident and your car's in the shop, would you need a rental car? And if you say yes, right, because you still got to go to work, well, then I can add the rental reimbursement coverage. For the test, it pays $20 a day. Now, you can always buy more. And in the real world, you typically will get more. Because right? 20 bucks a day is like a rent a wreck. Okay? Uh, that's not going to do a, a whole lot of, of good for you. All right? But you can add that on as optional coverage. Here and there, you're going to come across people that don't own cars. I mean, I know some people that live in the city. They do not, they do not own a car. They rely on public transportation or they borrow their friend's cars for local trips sometimes, or they rent a car for long trips. And so they're going to get an auto policy with an endorsement called sometimes named non-owned auto coverage or non-owned auto coverage. So it's liability coverage for someone who does not own a car. All right? But they borrow their friends' cars or they rent cars for long trips. That's how you want to understand it. So it's only the liability coverages because you cannot get physical damage coverage on a car you don't own. Okay. Whoever owns it. Remember, you always, always got to go back to insurable interest. Whoever owns the car can have coverage on the car. And so if it's not your car, you cannot get physical damage coverage for that car because you couldn't collect. It's not your car. Okay? Now, if you lend your car to your neighbor occasionally or lend your car to your friend occasionally, that's automatically covered by your policy. So you don't have to notify the insurance company. All right? Now, how you wanna understand that is insurance follows the vehicle. 
So if you borrow your neighbor's car to run some errands because your car's in the shop or, you know, maybe it's not working. Um, if it's just occasional use of another person's vehicle, um, if you get into an accident, your neighbor's insurance will be primary for that accident because it's their car. Now, if their insurance doesn't have enough as far as limits, your policy will be secondary. Right? Likewise, if your neighbor borrows your car to go to the store because their car's in the shop and they get into an accident, your insurance will be primary because it's your car and your neighbor's insurance will be excess if it's not enough coverage. So always remember, in occasional use of a vehicle is covered, and insurance follows the vehicle. You're going to get some questions on that one. Now, that's occasional use. Let's say you work for a company, and they furnish you with a company car for business and non-business use. So this is a vehicle furnished for regular use, and your policy specifically excludes coverage for vehicles used for regular use, okay, or furnished to you for regular use. That means if you work for a company and you have a company car and you use it to go to the store and you're allowed to, um, your policy won't cover that at all. So you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, it's a company car, they have coverage, it's okay. Great, but what if your employer was kind of cheap and they only got like 100,000 in liability coverage for the car that they're letting you use, and you get into an accident in that company car, and they're suing the company, but they're also suing you for three hundred thousand. They're suing you for three hundred thousand. I just said your employer gave you a hundred thousand dollars of liability coverage. Where's the other two hundred thousand dollar gap coming from? That's going to come after your personal assets because your personal auto policy excludes coverage for this situation. Okay, so there is no coverage. So what you could do is get extended non-owned auto coverage. And so now with this endorsement, you're extending coverage, liability coverages to a vehicle that you do not own, but you use regularly. That's how you want to understand it. Now, some people call it drive other car coverage. All right. Um, so if you know anyone that has a company car, this is a conversation you got to have with them. That even though, you know, it's a company car, their policy won't cover it and the employer's policy may not be enough. All right, so it's something to consider. There's no such thing as a motorcycle policy. There's no such thing as motorcycle coverage. It is an auto policy with an endorsement that is defining that this auto policy is actually covering a motorcycle. And that's called the miscellaneous type vehicle endorsement. Um, and it's used to define what the policy is covering. Could be a motorcycle, could be a dune buggy, could be a golf cart. Uh, could be an RV, it might be an ATV, all-terrain vehicle. And so again, this is not an endorsement that's going to really expand on coverage. This is an endorsement that defines that this auto policy is actually covering a motorcycle. All right. So it gets a little tricky because, I mean, you watch TV commercials and they say, hey, you get motorcycle coverage, right? Um, yeah, and for the real world, that's an easy way to understand it. But for the test world, no such thing. It's an auto policy with a miscellaneous type endorsement that's defining that we're covering a motorcycle. Okay. Your personal auto policy provides absolutely zero, zero, zero coverage in Mexico. There's absolutely no coverage in Mexico. Okay. However, so that's one question, by the way. Okay. The reason I emphasize that is because, you know, how far does your personal auto policy provide coverage in Mexico? And your response is it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. And there's a different question that if someone purchases the limited Mexico coverage endorsement, then it will cover them up to 25 miles into Mexico for no more than a 10 day trip. All right. So it's only a border town. So if you're actually going to run a car or, or, or drive in Mexico and go farther, you need to get the Mexico coverage because this is not going to be enough. Uh, when I say 25 miles in 25 miles into Mexico, that's 25 miles from the U.S. border, not 25 miles from the Mexican border. Right? Yeah, it's a little tricky piece that they put in the test also. Anything to get you to pay a retest fee, I tell you. Uh, test writers are very good, very creative. So, But it is passable. In California, you only need 60% to pass. Most other states, 70%. That's still a C-. minus. OK, and 70% and of the nation can't pass this test on the first try. That's crazy to me that 70% of the nation can't even get a C minus on the test. 
the first time they take it. Okay, so, uh, but yeah, I've got the tools and to help you out and feel confident in going through my material. All right. So now we're going to jump ship over to property policies. And we have one called a standard fire policy. Sometimes I'll just say SFP. Yeah, your test goes crazy with the abbreviations. All right, standard fire policy. Now, this is one we don't even sell this anymore. It's called a standard fire policy because it's the only policy where the wording is actually standardized by law. So if you actually look at the California Insurance Code or whichever state you're in, the insurance law, the state statutes of insurance, um, you'll actually see this whole policy's verbiage laid out in writing in the law book. Okay. Um, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, we get kind of a... Um, the policy form from the ISO and we kind of create our own terminology and present it. Now a standard fire policy is a very limited policy. It's a name peril policy so it only covers three perils, fire, lightning, and removal. So fire, well, let's go into more detail on that because there's different types of fire. A friendly fire you do not need insurance coverage for. A friendly fire is a fire in your fireplace. And if you have a fire within its intended limits, you don't need firefighters to come out to your house and put the fire in your fireplace out. Okay, that's where it's supposed to be. Hostile fire is a fire that escapes from its intended limits that is not intentionally set. So you have a fire in the fireplace, that's not covered, but a spark shoots out and catches your drapes on fire. And now it's out of control. That's a hostile fire that would be covered by insurance. Intentionally set fire would be arson, and that's not covered, all right? Because you cannot light your own house on fire and collect from your insurance. That's, that's a fraudulent claim. Now, don't get confused with someone else lights your house on fire, because to you, that's a hostile fire, okay? And that would be covered. But if you lit your own house on fire, no coverage. Removal is more of a situation than a peril. Your house is on fire. First thing you do, get you and your family out safely. Second thing you do, call 911. Third thing you do is try and remove your belongings out of your burning house, put it on the front yard or the driveway or your neighbor's yard to protect it from further loss. And while you're removing it, it's covered on an all risk basis. That means even though this is a limited, only covering fire lightning type of policy, during removal, it's all risks. That means if anything happens, your belongings as you're moving it out of the burning building to protect it from loss, um, we cover it. So imagine your house is on fire. You get out with your family, you call 911. You're running in the house, grabbing some stuff, putting in your neighbor's driveway. You run back in the house to get some more stuff and you're putting it out in your neighbor's driveway next to the stuff that, what the heck, uh, your stuff's gone. So as you're taking stuff out of the house, people are stealing it. The unavoid unavoidable theft during removal is actually covered, even though a standard fire policy doesn't specifically name theft as covered peril, as a covered peril. Okay, so it's kind of cool to have that. And it, it's more of a situation. Your standard fire policy covers removal for five days. That means we cover your property at another location for up to five days. Okay, after that, you want to make it sure it's more secure. Whereas a dwelling policy basic form covers fire, lightning, and instead of removal, because that's automatic on all of our policies now, uh, it's internal explosion. Okay. So you're going to get some comparison contrast questions. A standard fire policy provides coverage for which of the following? And the answer is fire, lightning, removal. But you'll see fire, lightning, and internal explosion is one of your other answers. Then you get another question, a dwelling policy basic form or DP1 provides coverage for which of the following. You need to know that it's fire, lightning, and internal explosion, but fire, lightning, and removal will be one of your other answers. So you want to keep them separate. Okay. As far as the coverage parts of a policy, coverage A is a dwelling. So, I mean, look at your house. Or if you're in an apartment, look at the house across the street. Dwelling is the house. Anything bolted, weld, nailed, attached to it, that would be coverage A. Coverage B would be any other structures, like the fence around the backyard. Maybe it's a separate garage. Maybe you have a shed in the back. That would be coverage B, other structures. Coverage C is your personal property. 
That means if you flip your house upside down, anything that falls, that would be your furniture, your clothes, your pots and pans, and your salt and pepper shaker, easily removable, that would be covered C, personal property, which a lot of times on the test is also called contents coverage. All right. And your personal property, by the way, is covered anywhere in the world. Okay, so if you take a vacation and take a lot of your stuff with you and something happens at the hotel, like a fire destroys it, it's covered from this little policy you bought here. All right. Now, coverage A and B are what we call real property. Those are structures on the premises. Coverage C is personal property or contents coverage. Now, A, B, and C are what we call direct loss coverage. Direct physical loss, damage, or destruction to your property. Coverage C um, is indirect loss coverage. All right, so you're, you're a landlord. Let's say you have, I'm just going to keep it real simple. You have a house. It's a single unit house for one family. You own the house, but you rent it out to other people. And that's fine. So you need, since you own the house, you need coverage for the, the house, the dwelling, other structures, personal property. Uh, personal property, you can kind of reduce the limit because probably the only thing you have there is utilities, right? Washer, dryer, refrigerator, okay? And, you know, you can get lower coverage because whoever rents it from you, they need their own policy to cover their clothes, their furniture, okay? You're, as a landlord, you're not going to cover their stuff. They need their own coverage. But if the house burns down, the renters have to relocate. The home is what we call untenable. And if they can't live there, they have to stay someplace else. They're not going to continuously still pay you rent, but you relied on the rental income to meet your expenses. And that's coverage D, lost rents. We're going to pay missing rents minus utilities, such as like, uh, I'm sorry, uh, discontinued. We pay lost rents minus discontinued expenses, which is utilities, because there's nobody there using gas electric anyway, if they had to relocate. Okay, so now if you had a three unit structure where you lived in one unit, you rented out the other two, the rental income will cover the lost rents for the two units that you rented out. But if you can't live there in the third unit, you have to live in a hotel till they rebuild it. That's additional living expenses. That's going to cover the cost to put you up at a hotel to be rebuild your house so you can move back in. So coverage D and E are actually in um, uh, indirect loss or sometimes called consequential loss coverage. Kind of like a restaurant burns down, that's a direct loss, but because they're closed up, um, the insurance company will pay lost income to the owner, lost revenues that they would normally earn if they were open for business. Um, that's indirect, all right? So you wanna know the difference between direct and indirect loss coverage. Now, since your standard fire policy and your dwelling policy, basic form, only cover three perils, fire, lightning, removal, or fire, lightning, and internal explosion, well, then for a slight additional charge, we can add extended coverages. And when you see extended coverages, it's a package of seven additional perils that will provide coverage on your property. And I'm going to use the abbreviations WHARVES, W-H-A-R-V-E-S, WHARVES. W is for windstorm which covers windstorm. H is for hail, which covers damage because of hail. It's pretty simple and straightforward. A is for aircraft. Now, not that you own an aircraft. An aircraft crashes into your house, okay? Uh, then pay your deductible and we'll cover the loss. R is for riot. Maybe there's a peaceful demonstration. It gets out of hand and a riot ensues. That would be riot or civil commotion you'll sometimes see. Vehicles, again, not your vehicle. Someone without insurance loses control and drives into your living room. Okay, this is going to be covered by your policy. Pay your deductible, the insurance company who covers the loss. E is for explosion and S is for smoke. Now, when I say smoke, that means two-story homes typically have greater losses than a one-story home. Because if there's a fire downstairs, it'll do smoke damage upstairs. But if there's a fire upstairs, then when we put the fire out, it's going to do water damage downstairs. All right? So that's how you want to understand that. But again, it's a package of seven additional perils. Uh, of the exam, you kind of want to know these seven perils, windstorm, hail, aircraft, riots, vehicle explosions, smoke. 
And on the exam, they're going to ask you which of the following is not an example of an extended coverage peril. So if you know what this the seven are, windstorm, hail, aircraft, rides, vehicle, explosion, smoke, then you know flood and earthquake are not one of those perils. Okay. So if you get extended coverages, then for an additional charge, you can purchase vandalism and malicious mischief. Now, with the vandalism and malicious mischief coverage, there is a 60-day limit. And what that means is if your property is left vacant or unoccupied for more than 60 days, we're not going to cover vandalism losses. See, if no one's watching your house for more than two months, it kind of becomes a target for vandals. And so the risk increases. Okay. So if you're taking a vacation for more than two months, get a house sitter so that someone's watching out for the property to keep from that happening. Okay. Um, and so those are some of the coverages that are part of the standard fire policy and also the dwelling coverages. With dwelling coverages, I kind of reviewed a basic form, fire, lightning, internal explosion. Okay. A broad form is also a name peril form. All right, remember, basic and broader name peril forms. That means if you look in the policy and you look at these cause of loss forms, whatever perils are listed there is covered. Okay, so if something happens to your property and it's not on this list, it would not be covered. So basic and broad are kind of limited in, in scope as far as what they'll cover. If you want the more comprehensive or broader coverage, then you want to get what's called the DP3 or the special form. A special form is what we call an all risk or open peril form. And that means we cover anything that you could possibly imagine that happens to your property other than this small list of exclusions. And so they're kind of opposites of each other. Basic and broad list perils we cover, special list perils we exclude. So if a loss occurs, we look on our DP3, the cause of loss form, the special form. We look at the list of exclusions. And if it's not on that list of exclusions, it's covered. All right. So again, it's very comprehensive. So in a dwelling policy, DP1 is good. DP2 is better because it does cover more perils. But DP3 would be the best because very comprehensive. We cover everything that could happen except for this list of perils. Okay. So good, better, best. Uh, remember, dwelling, you're a landlord, okay? There's some optional coverages uh, for the landlord policy, and the first one is theft coverage. There's two options. You have broad theft and limited theft. And the, the, the coverage here is depending on whether you live there or you don't. If you live in the property, then you can get broad theft. But if you own a property and you don't live there, you can only get limited theft. All right, because whoever lives there, they have coverage for their own stuff. All right, so the limited theft would be like your appliances, the built-in appliances, the refrigerator, right, the stove, and things like that. Um, and any others, maybe leave some small furniture there. Uh, we have limited coverage for that. Okay. Another thing that's optional is personal liability. Okay, because um, again, as a landlord, you can add it, but if you own a home elsewhere, the easiest way to cover liability at another location is extend the liability coverage on your homeowner's policy to this other property. All right, so it, it's just a, a cheaper, easier way. However, that's not the case. You can buy liability and add it to this policy. All right. So again, theft and liability are optional on a dwelling policy. All right, and we'll go more detail into that. So jumping over to homeowners, all right? I mean, we call it a homeowner's policy. Uh, again, remember for the test, sometimes you'll see an ISO homeowner's policy, right? Sometimes you'll see unendorsed homeowner's policy, and it's the same. Okay, so don't get bogged down by that additional verbiage that they use to just kind of distract you and throw you off, okay? So with homeowner's coverage, it's a package policy. So section one covers property. And coverage A, B, and C are just like dwelling coverage. Coverage A covers the house. Coverage B covers other structures like the fence, the separate garage, the pool. Coverage C covers your personal property anywhere in the world, right? But instead of having lost rents and additional living expenses, with the homeowner's policy, we actually combine lost rents and additional living expenses, and we just categorize it as loss of use coverage. 
right? So loss of use would be the indirect loss coverage where if you lived in this house and you had a fire where you cannot live there, uh, loss of use covers the cost to put you up at a hotel till we rebuild the house and you move back in. That's basically how that works, okay? Theft is built in. So remember with dwelling, theft was optional, but in a homeowner's policy, it's built in. There are a few sublimits. So theft of jewelry for the test on your homeowner's policy will pay a maximum of $1,500 to replace all your uh, jewelry that you have uh, due to theft loss. So if you have more than $1,500 of jewelry that your rate could get stolen, well, then you can get the floater coverage, the jewelry floater, which will increase coverage to the uh, replacement value of your jewelry. All right. Firearms, we pay a maximum $2,500 under your homeowner's policy. So if your firearms exceed that amount, then you get a floater, okay, which we'll get into. Some other things, silverware, $2,500. If you have a trailer um, that's not attached to a vehicle, uh, either used for watercraft or not, uh, we only pay $1,500 maximum if something happens to that trailer. And so you can increase coverage in some of those cases. All right. Uh, and that's kind of the theft piece. Section two is liability, which covers you and your family members anywhere in the world. That means if you're in a golf course in southern Italy and you shank that ball and hit someone in the head, and put them into a coma, the liability section from your home policy can cover that lawsuit, even though it's in another country. Medical is for other people. So this is a change also because in auto insurance, medical covers you and your passengers and your car that are injured because of an accident you caused. Under a home policy, medical and liability are for other people. It's not for you and your family members. So if you slipped and fell in your own kitchen, you cannot file a claim against your homeowner's policy because you really can't sue yourself for everything that you already own. But if you have a cocktail party, one of your guests slips and falls and hits their head uh, on the ground as they go down, they can sue you because they don't own your stuff yet. So remember, whenever you see L for liability, think L for lawsuit. All right? Someone got injured because of your actions or on your premises, and they want to sue you to pay for it, either for them bodily injury or their stuff, which is the property damage. All right. Medical payments, quite simply, I would just say is a small amount, just covers like the ambulance ride. OK, so someone slips and falls, hits their head. Medical payments covers the ambulance ride. The liability covers the medical bills and the lost wages because they're in a hospital, you know, um, recovering from this injury. Uh, and that's how you want to understand that. All right. There's different types of homeowners coverages. H01 is not sold in California, and we typically haven't seen it on the exam either. Okay, but I did want to put it in here. Okay, uh, but H01 would be the basic form, which is a very limited policy. H02 is a broad form, it just covers more than the H01, uh, but it's still a very limited policy. Uh, H03 is a special form, that means we have better coverage on the structure, uh, we have all risk coverage on the structure. Um, so, I mean, if, if it's not on the exclusion list, it's covered. There's no such thing as a renter's policy. Okay, remember this for the test. In the real world, yeah, we call it renter's coverage, renter's policy all the time. For the test, no. It is a homeowner's policy for someone who's renting an apartment or a home called an HO4. And it's a broad form because it's really, with the, with the HO4, there's no coverage for the building. Because as a renter, you don't own the building. The landlord owns the building, so they should have coverage for the building. You're covering your belongings in someone else's building. Another thing about renters, it does have theft. Right? It also includes liability coverage. I should say one more thing. If the place burns down, a renter's policy has loss of use coverage, which gives you money to stay at a hotel or put a deposit and live somewhere else. Okay. So that's kind of a good thing. Uh, HO5 is a, also a special homeowner's policy, kind of like an HO3. It's actually a little better than an HO3. The real difference between an HO3 home policy and an HO5 home policy is HO5 just gives you better coverage on your personal property. That's really the only difference between the two. So if you own a home, since HO1 is not sold in California, HO2 is good. HO3 would be better but HO5 would be the best if you own a home. 
And that's how you want to understand that. And when you're on my website, I do have some charts uh, that kind of give you a little more detail about the differences between the homeowner's policies. And I also have some other recorded webinars on there also. There's no such thing as a condo policy. Remember, it's a homeowner's policy for someone who owns a condo called an HO6. Now, the condo, whether it's downtown or in farmland community, it's still an HO6. The test will throw you. Let's say Jack owns a condo in the middle of farmland community. What type of policy should Jack own? And the choice is basically between a condo and a farm policy. And your answer is a condo. He owns a condo. doesn't matter it's in the middle of a farm community. He owns a condo. That's an HO6. If he owned the farm, then he'd get into farm coverage. Okay? So be aware of that. Uh, HO8, once in a while you get this on the test. An HO8 is a modified HO1 for older homes, antique homes. Uh, I guess in our area, be Victorian style homes. Um, the HO8 is a unique policy because it pays actual cash value. That means all of our policies typically give you replacement costs. If you have a three bedroom, two bath house and it burns down, we're going to rebuild it to the same three bedroom, two bath house. Okay. What, whatever it was before the fire. But an HO8 is covering an antique home. And if an antique home burns down, we can rebuild it to look just like it did before the fire, but it's not an antique anymore. Okay, and so we basically um, use actual cash value. What would it cost to replace this house minus depreciation? That's the actual cash value uh, equation. And so, yeah, so it's a very limited policy, um, which is, um, again, very rare to get a test question on that one, too, but just in case. Okay, all right. So the difference between homeowners and dwelling is a homeowner's is a self-contained package. It covers property. Property includes theft and liability. Dwelling is only property. So like in going to a restaurant, you know, you, you, let's say you're going to a, a hamburger place and they have two menus. You know, they have the combo plate where you pick a burger and it comes with fries and a drink automatically. Well, that would be your home policy. Property would be the burger. Theft would be the fries. Liability would be the drink. And it's cheaper if you buy the package. Dwelling would be pick off the a la carte menu. All right, pick which burger you want. You want a hamburger, DP1, you want a cheeseburger, DP2, or did you want the gourmet burger, which is a DP3? Now, in picking out a burger, would you like to add fries and a drink? Because that would be additional charge. That would be the theft and the liability coverage for additional charge, okay? So homeowners is a combo plate. Dwelling is eating off the a la carte menu, okay? So in, in understanding it or seeing that, it may be a little easier. Uh, when you're reviewing it, uh, sample test questions and studying on uh, for your test. All right. So additional coverages. I talked about floaters. Okay, floaters, uh, additional charge to cover those high theft items you may have. And we have two basic types that can be added to your home or dwelling policy. We have unscheduled and scheduled. All right. So the personal property floater is unscheduled. So remember I said the maximum we pay for theft of jewelry is $1,500. And let's say you just have a lot of little stuff that's a little bit more than $1,500, but altogether not more than $10,000. And so then you get a personal property floater, and it's just a general increase of your jewelry, okay, above the homeowner's policy limit, but no more than $10,000 total, okay? And that's all it is. It's unscheduled. So we don't need a list or itemized list of what you have, but if you suffer loss, you have to have proof of loss. Now, if you got some high ticket items where you have single unique items worth more than $10,000 per item, then you get a personal article floater. And whenever you see scheduled, that means I do need an itemized list and I do want appraisal values. Okay, so if something happens, we're going to give you that replacement cost value. So those are for your high ticket items. Okay, so for this, just think anytime you see floaters or think of floaters, think of high theft items. All right, again, jewelry, firearms, fur coats, uh, stamp coin collections, that's kind of what we're talking about, where you just want increased limits because your homeowner's policy doesn't quite have enough to, to cover your collection. Okay. Um, what's very rare is a personal effects floater. And so if you have someone that travels a lot, you know, like they're backpacking all over Europe, uh, this only covers the stuff that they have on their person. 
So that would be their camera, their passport, their traveler's checks, whatever's on their person as they're traveling in another country. Uh, might be easier to just buy a separate policy for that trip to cover your stuff on that trip versus it's a claim against your homeowners and your rates go up for the next three years. Okay, so, um, and that's how you want to know that. In California, workers' compensation is a mandatory endorsement. That means it's built in. All right. Now, when I say workers' comp, that would be you have someone that you hire, either they live there um, or they come there and they upkeep the property. So we're talking about, you know, landscaping, upkeeping the maid, uh, maid cleaning uh, the property. That's it. A uh, home business is a whole nother world. That's not really what we're talking about. And anyone you hire to maybe paint your house or do work at your house, you should actually make sure they have their own certificate of workers' compensation because it would reduce the likelihood of them getting injured and of filing a claim against you. Okay, that's how that works. If you own a mobile home, you can cover it using a homeowner's policy with an endorsement called an MH200. You can add it to an HO2 or HO3. You cannot get an HO5 for a mobile home. All right. The mobile home must be at least 10 feet by 40 feet. That's a single wide and worth at least $4,000 to be covered. Uh, but that, yeah, you can cover a mobile home under an HO2 or HO3. All right. So um, I believe the year is 1972. If the, prop, if the building was built before 1972, it's a mobile home. And if it was built after 1972, it's a manufactured or modular home. Okay, so that's the difference. That's not on a test. I just throw in some useless knowledge here and there because when you're in the real world selling and talking to people, you need to know that it's a mobile home or a manufactured home because if you miss call it a manufactured home, they get upset. Oh no, 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 this here's a mobile home. Like, oh, oh, you know, uh, it's, it's a weird mindset, but, uh, just let you know. Okay. All right, let's move on. Boat owners. <laughs> One way to cover a small watercraft is adding it to your home policy. All right. And it says scheduled because we need to know that it's a 20 foot bass fishing boat, uh, with a 20 horsepower engine. Okay. Uh, that can be scheduled as a watercraft endorsement added to your home policy. The thing about that is remember if you slip and fall in your house, you cannot file a claim on your home policy. You should have health insurance. That means if you add your boat to your home policy, it's going to copy your homeowner's policy. That means if you slip and fell in your boat, it won't cover you. Okay. It will only cover your guests because that's liability and medical. So if you want better coverage, or if it's a larger boat, more than 25 horsepower, a sailboat that's larger than 26 feet, you're going to have to get at least a boat owner's policy. Now, a boat owner's policy is very similar in design to an auto policy, and that's a common test question. Think of auto insurance. You need three basic coverages. You need a liability in case you hit someone, medical for you and your family in your car, and physical damage for your car. So with a boat owner's policy, same coverages. You need liability in case you hit something, right? Medical for you and your passengers on your boat and physical damage for your boat. Right? So, I mean, that's all it really is. It's just, they're both vehicles. One's on land, one's on water, but the coverages are the same. Aircraft coverage, same thing, right? Again, yeah, aircraft, you need liability in case you hit something, medical for you and your passengers and physical damage for your plane. So again, all three are vehicles, one's on land, one's on water, one's in the air, but the coverages are the same. Now, when we jump from a boat owner's policy to a yacht policy is if you're going in the ocean. A yacht policy is a, a boat with a different shaped or sized hull to stay afloat in large body masses of water. Okay. And that would be a yacht policy. Now, we're going to change the coverage names to, instead of calling it physical damage coverage, we're going to call it hull, H-U-L-L coverage. Instead of calling it liability and medical, we're going to call it protection and indemnity. It includes workers' comp in case you hire a captain. Well, I start. So, <laughs> uh, protection and indemnity can also include workers' comp for the captain and crew that you hired to take you and your family on a pleasure trip. 
Now, a yacht policy is personal use of a boat. This isn't business use. Okay, so it's not a cruise ship. It's not that you have a boat that you rent out to people and to make some money. This is personal use for boat owners and uh, yacht coverage. All right. All right. Excess liability. So I'm in California, very Sue happy state. So if you want additional liability over one line of coverage, you just get an excess liability policy. So let's go back to people that I know that live in the city. They don't own a car. So they don't have auto liability, okay? Um, but they do have parties at their house and they want additional liability. And so they can get excess liability, which is additional liability over one line of coverage, their home policy. But if you have multiple lines, then you get an umbrella policy. And this is higher limits of liability coverage over, over multiple lines, like auto, um, a home, which is personal liability associated with your home or dwelling policy, okay? It could be a boat owner's policy. Um, and if you do have a liability exposure that's not covered by a primary policy, you can actually pay a self-insured retention, which is basically a deductible, and your umbrella liability could cover that claim. Okay? So whenever you hear umbrella, think higher limits, broader coverage, even some coverages that aren't covered by the underlying policy. But always remember, umbrella is an excess policy. So if there's no underlying or primary policy, you'd have to pay something before the excess policy can kick in. So it's basically a deductible. I guess a better picture of understanding that would be this. As you can see, excess liability is additional liability over one line of coverage, <clears throat> excuse me, and an umbrella is over multiple lines. Okay, and that's how you want to understand. Now you can't get like the minimum liability in these underlying policies and then get the umbrella. I mean, you have to have reasonable amounts of liability in your home policy, usually 300,000 um, before you can get an umbrella. Your auto, you got to have split limits of 250, 500 before you can get the umbrella. And even a boat, you need typically 300,000 um, as far as liability before you can get that umbrella. And umbrella is typically a million dollars or more of additional lawsuit protection. So if you got into an auto accident, you injure someone, it's your fault, they're suing you for 800,000. All right, so let's say you have 250000 on your auto policy and you have a million-dollar umbrella. Your auto policy will pay the first 250000 and then the other 550000 is going to come out of the umbrella policy. All right? um, and so that's what that does. It's additional lawsuit protection versus you liquidating your estate because you bought lower limits or you did not choose to protect yourself. Okay? So that's how you want to understand that. All right? So with that, I'm going to open it up right now. Do you have any questions? What timing? About an hour. That was actually not bad, huh? <laughs> yeah. Gives you a good overview. Right. So I can take this as much as possible because some of these terms are new to me and, you know. That's why I recorded this. I'm going to put it on my site. Actually, I might put this public on YouTube. So, yeah. Cool. You got it. So yeah, don't hesitate. Um, you can, I like I like having the recordings because you can go back, you can pause it, go back and rehear it again. Okay. So yeah, you, yeah it's great. It. It's great information. Good. All right. So you're getting a taste of what I have on my site. Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. All right. So with that, um, sometimes I get people that have not registered yet. Um, they can go to lgdstudy.com. Uh, when you purchase, uh, you get 60 days access. You will receive an email with your login information and instructions on how to use my site. And my only request is be open and coachable. My way of teaching you and coaching you and helping you study to pass this test is a little different than your traditional learning. Uh, a lot of my material, I use what's called accelerated learning techniques, um, which really reduces your study time in getting the concepts that you need just to pass the test. Uh, this is a tough part, passing this test. So after this, continuing education is online, typically. Open book exam. Uh, C minus with an open book exam. Pretty easy stuff. Right? But this is the tough part. All right. So with that, thank you for uh, hanging out with me for this uh, period of time. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out. Um, but other than that, you have a good night. Thank you. I really appreciate you it. it. You got All it. Right.